everyone. Welcome back to the 100 Days of the 2023 National Logical Code Changes Series. My name's Ryan Jackson, and I hope you're having a great day. We're just about done. We're in Chapter 7, which is one of the trickier chapters in the NEC, and in my opinion, it doesn't get much trickier than Article 705. Now, maybe this is because I never really wired solar as an electrician. Uh, Article 705 isn't limited to solar. Solar, of course, is Article 690. But 690 is the PV, the solar stuff. Article 705 is how we connect it to the other source. So Article 705 in today's day and age is usually when we have solar and a utility. Now, that's not the only application of Article 705. Article 705 applies anytime we have more than one power source and they're operating at the same time. Now, in a traditional installation, let's say we have a house and a backup generator. Does Article 705 apply? No, because you have a transfer switch, right? So you're either running on the utility service or you're running on the generator, one or the other. It gets a lot more complex when you're running two sources like the utility and the PV when you're running them at the same time. So one of the concerns, of course, is backfeeding the utility if the utility loses power. One of the reasons, and probably the reason, that we have transfer equipment for a generator is when the utility shuts off, transfer switch switches over, the generator turns on, but we can't backfeed the utility and kill the electrical workers that are working on the utility system. Well, what if we have the solar and the PV operating at the same time? What's to save the electrical workers then if the utility shuts off? Well, you have what's called an interactive inverter, and the inverter shuts off. So when the utility loses power, the PV also shuts down so that we're not backfeeding each other and killing each other. So when you have two systems operating at the same time, things are a lot more complex. So Article 705 is, by its very nature, a somewhat complex article, and a lot of people struggle with it. Now, there were a lot of changes in 690 and 705 over the last two code editions to really try to focus on which one should have the rules. Article 690 is the solar stuff. 705 is the interconnection. And we kind of had those rules jumbled up a little bit. You had some solar rules in 705, and you had some interconnection rules in 690. Well, they really did a good job of trying to separate those apart, saying, look, 690 is solar, 705 is how you connect it to another power source. Now, again, one more time, it's not limited to solar. If I have multiple power sources operating in parallel, fuel cells and a utility, fuel cells and a PV system, right? If I have multiple sources operating at the same time, then you're in the land of Article 705. So let's take a peek. Article 705, the biggest changes here happened in section 705.11, which is connections to a service. And by the way, I think they really did a nice job here. The requirements for connecting to a service were clarified and simplified. Now, a lot of people refer to this in the, in the solar world they refer to this as a line side tap. I hate that phrase passionately. I cannot stand it when I hear somebody say line side tap because the word tap, I think, can sometimes be cause for confusion. Um, a tap could just be like a splice or when you have two wires and you make a third wire. Is that a tap? Is it a splice? I don't know. But a lot of people when they talk about a tap, they want to talk about a feeder tap. So feeder taps, of course, are covered in 240.21. If you tie into service conductors, you cannot, by definition, make a tap on service conductors. Look at the definition of tap conductor in Article 100. It says it's a conductor other than a service conductor that has overcurrent protection upstream of it, you know, exceeding its normal rating. By definition, there's no such thing as a service conductor tap. So, look, if you want to call it a line side tap, be my guest. I, I don't care. Uh, I try not to use that phrase because I think it can be confusing for people. So, when we're connecting on the supply side of the service, what are the rules? That's what 705.11 talks about. So, connections uh, may be made to a new service in accordance with 230.2a. So you create a new service for your interconnect system. 
or the supply side of a service disconnect in accordance with 230.82 item 6, which is uh, one of the permitted things that, you're, that you can do upstream of the service. Remember, 230.82 gives a list of, I think it's about 10 items now. Uh, 230.82 starts by saying, listen, nothing can be installed upstream of the service disconnect. No equipment, like transformers or transfer switches, motors, you know, can't connect anything upstream of service disconnect, except these 10 items. And one of those 10 items is an interconnected power production source. So yes, we can connect upstream of the service equipment, 230.82 item six, or item three, you can use an additional set of service conductors using 230.40 exception number five. And I know that this is kind of geeky and, and I, I don't know how to make this any more simple. Again, Article 705 is by its nature somewhat complex. So here in the picture, i bring up my laser pointer here, we have our normal service. And then of course we've decided that we wanted to add a PV system. We're going to operate them at the same time, which puts us into Article 705. So in the 2020 code, they made a change to the definition of the word service. All right, and this is actually kind of important. Historically, the definition of a service was the conductors and equipment that come from the utility to the customer. So it was unidirectional, from them to us. Well, once I connect a PV system, it's no longer just from them to us. It's also from us back to them. So they made a change to the definition of service, saying it's not from them to us. It's, it's the connection between the utility and us. All right? So that's what a service is. It's where the utility connects to us. Not from them to us, not from us to them, just where we connect. So with that in mind, this new disconnect down here is a service disconnect. Now for years, you could easily debate it as to whether or not that was a service disconnect. And twist my arm, I don't think it was in previous versions of the code until the 2020. Now, this is absolutely unequivocally a service disconnect, it is. I know it's coming from us to them, but that doesn't matter where the premises meets the utility, that's a service. So this is a service disconnect. How many service disconnects can I have? Now this is where we're gonna get down a rabbit hole and I want you to kind of stick with me here because this can get real weird real fast. If I were to ask you, how many service disconnects can you have? A lot of people are going to quickly say, well, you can have six. That's true. You can have six service disconnects per service, right? It's not per building. What if I have a massive building that has two services? You might have one service on this side of the building, another service on this side of the building because it's a you know 10,000 amp service. Well, you can have six service disconnects over here and six over here. You have to have signage to tell people, right? So it's not six per building, it's six per service. Or if you read 230.72, it's not just six per service, it's six service disconnects per set of permitted service entrance conductors. Now, the general rule, when you go into 230.40, says, look, each service can only supply one set of service entrance conductors. But there's five exceptions to that, all right? So what we have here in the photograph is potentially multiple sets of service entrance conductors, all right? So here, coming underground, you have a service lateral, all right? Utility owned conductors. Let's say the service point is the meter. That's where the utility says, hey, it's your problem from here on out. Coming out of this meter, we might go into the house and into a service disconnect, all right? That would mean the conductors between the meter and the service disconnect are service entrance conductors. So that's one set, we have one lateral, feeding one set of service entrance conductors. Beautiful thing, right? Totally code compliant. And then all of a sudden we decide we wanna add solar. So now what do we do? Well, we come off the load side of the meter 
and we splice onto the service entrance conductors and we make a second set of service entrance conductors going down the liquid tie right here. That would be an additional set of service entrance conductors. So now I could have up to six service disconnects for the set of service entrance conductors on the right and I could have up to six service disconnects for the set of service entrance conductors on the left and they do not have to be grouped. The six service disconnects for this set of service conductors must be grouped. The other set of six has to be grouped, but they don't have to be grouped together. All right, and this is something that is becoming majorly problematic in, in the enforcement industry. So having one service disconnect, and it is a service disconnect, having one out here and one inside is actually okay. Take a look at 230.80, all right? So going back to 705.11, I know we kind of took a walk on the wild side there, but, but we have to on this issue. We've got our two sets of service entrance conductors. So far, this is a code compliant installation, all right? So if the new meter right here is a service point, then these guys here are service conductors and these PV conductors are not service conductors, right? Because that's the service disconnect. Service conductors end at the service disconnect. So if my meter is the service point, then these conductors going down would be service entrance conductors, perfectly fine. It's a second set allowed by 230.40 exception five. Let's keep going. How do you size service conductors? Well, service conductors do have minimum sizing requirements. So service conductors connected to power production sources coming out of the PV disconnect to the meter, they have to be sized for what? For the output ratings of the PV system, right? Or the power production system or the energy management system as indicated in 705.28. Okay, so there's two ways so far that I size those service conductors. And again, just to keep the, the discussion as simple as we can, let's just keep this in the realm of solar, okay, just to make it easy. How do you size those conductors? You're going to size those conductors based on the capacity of your generating system, right? So your PV modules, you're going to size those conductors to carry the load or the, the, the capacity of the PV system. Or the energy management system. So maybe we install an energy management system on the PV system and we say, okay, we're never gonna generate more than 30 amps or whatever. So we're gonna take the 30 amps times 125% because we treat it as a continuous load and you're gonna size those conductors based on the energy management system settings. And number two, not smaller than six gauge copper or eight gauge aluminum or copper clad aluminum. Very similar to the to the rules in 230.42. We, we have a minimum size conductor for service conductors because let's remember, uh, if the utility system, if the utility conductors fault, let, let's say the, the service lateral conductors down here, if they were to fault, they're going to become energized. And there's going to be a lot of current flowing. We don't want these things to just be like number 12 wires that just evaporate. So we do need to have a minimum size on those conductors and that minimum size six gauge copper, eight gauge aluminum, or copper clad aluminum. Is that backwards? Why would I have a bigger copper? Let's see if I'm, uh, if I'm smoking crack here, because that doesn't make sense. We're gonna go to 705.11, we're gonna keep this in the video just to show that I'm not a robot and that I make mistakes sometimes too. Yeah, six gauge copper or four gauge aluminum or copper clad aluminum. <laughs> I knew reading that it didn't make sense. So I have a typo there. My apologies. So six gauge copper or four gauge aluminum or copper clad aluminum, like I said. Let's keep going. Connections. Connections to service conductors must comply with 705.11C1 through C3. And really what this does is it's going to default back to Article 230, which it should because they're connections to service conductors. So splices and taps have to comply with 230.33 and 230.46. All right, so the general splicing rules for service conductors is going to say that you have to use listed splicing devices and 
that they have to be listed for use on the supply side of service equipment. Now, a lot of splicing devices do not have that marking. Take a look at 230.46 for the exact language, but a lot of splicing devices are not allowed on the supply side of the service. And that's kind of a different discussion, but suffice it to say, it has to have a special marking. If the service equipment is modified, then it must be done in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions or be field labeled. Yeah, you know, sometimes people get way too creative with this stuff. You know, here's an example of a modification that, believe it or not, is not in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. You, you can't just sawzall a new hole here for your circuit breaker. And again, those of you guys that are uh, specialty inspectors and you get to see a lot of different people's work, uh, you're, you're going to know this. People modify equipment in bizarre ways, especially when it comes to solar, because we have existing equipment and we want, it, we want that existing equipment to kind of fit into what we're doing without replacing it, and people get way, way too creative. So it's follow instructions or have it field labeled. So if you have no instructions and you're modifying the equipment, then you're gonna to have to call a field evaluation body. You're gonna call somebody like UL or Intertech or QPS or TUV, there's a million of them. You're gonna to have to have them come out and do a field evaluation. And if they sign off on it, then they'll do a field label and give you a field evaluation report. C3, connections in equipment that's under the exclusive control of an electric utility are only allowed if the utility allows them. All right, so yeah, if, if the utility says, listen, this section here to the left, that's our cash register. Keep your greedy hands out of it. <laughs> Is the utility within their right to say that? Of course they are. If they don't want you splicing in there, then that's their prerogative. So we need to make sure that we're satisfying not just the NEC, but the utility as well. Service disconnect, 705.11D. A service disconnecting means that complies with Article 230 must disconnect the ungrounded conductors from the conductors of other systems. So yeah, if we're adding a service disconnect, we probably are, then we need to follow Article 230. No problem. Grounding and bonding, 705.11e. This is something that confuses a lot of people. Grounding and bonding must comply with parts two through five, as well as part eight of Article 250. Now, in the 2020 code, they added section 250.25, which is for systems upstream of the service equipment. And it basically just says, hey, if you have stuff upstream of the service disconnect, ground it and bond it like you would service disconnects. Cool. But then people are like, well, but what does that mean? Okay, well, let, let's go back here to the picture. We'll figure out what that means. Now, we already mentioned this guy here is a service disconnect. Do me a favor for a minute. Stop thinking about solar, okay? Just for the next couple of minutes, stop thinking about solar, and I want you to think that this little disconnect that we added here, let's just pretend that it's going to an air conditioner, or a fire pump, or a motor, or God, think of anything but solar, because the second you start thinking about solar, you get confused, and it's like, well, power's coming this way, and it's coming this way. Okay, just, just, just time out. Pretend that this is just feeding an air conditioner. Now you know how to wire it, right? How do you wire that disconnect? It's on the supply side of the service. Service conductors supply it, so two aughts in the ground dead conductor, the neutral, right? You bond the neutral to the equipment with a main bonding jumper. Downstream of it, you separate the neutral and ground just like you would, right? That's how we would do it if that disconnect was serving a fire pump or an air conditioner or anything else, guess what? It's the same rules if it's serving a PV system, okay? So forget that it's PV, just, it's a service disconnect, all right? It's a service disconnect, and downstream of the service disconnect, you don't connect neutral to ground, right? So just wire it like it's a motor or anything else. So 705.11e, grounding and bonding, refers you back ultimately to 250.25, which says, listen, it's a service disconnect, so wire it like it's a service disconnect. The last thing here in 705.11f, overcurrent protection. Overcurrent protection, complying with part seven of article 230 is required, okay, no problem. For the purposes of GFPE in 230.95, the rating of the power production equipment is used. Okay, 
230.95 requires ground fault protection of equipment if the rating of the breaker, if the rating of the surface disconnect is greater, is 1,000 amps or more and 277.480. This is not going to come up too terribly often in Article 705. I'm not saying it can't. You can certainly have a big system that requires ground fault protection of equipment. I'm just saying literally 99% of the time this section is not going to come up. So don't worry too much about this unless you're doing very, very large systems indeed. Now if you are doing large systems, then yeah, the rating of the power production equipment is going to determine whether or not you need ground fault protection of equipment. If you have 277, 480, and it's a thousand amps or more of generating capacity, then you need ground fault protection of equipment. So there you go. All right, we made it through 705.11. One of the trickier subjects in the code, in my opinion, is Article 705. 705.11, 705.12, two really tricky sections. But I can tell you this, they made both of those sections a lot better in the 2023 code. I'm not going to cover 705.12 because they didn't do as much there, but 705.11, I think they did some really good stuff there. It's still tricky, but it's a tricky subject. So, all right, we made it through, in my opinion, the most difficult article in the code, Article 705. Now we're going to get into the low voltage and limited energy stuff that kind of takes up the very back end of the code. And I promise the rest of these videos are actually going to go a lot faster than this one did. So I hope you'll stick around and I hope to see you then.